Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. What you're about to hear, you should never need to know to fly a drone. But Transport Canada does require drone pilots to be able to read, understand, and actually use VFR charts. So let's get into it. VFR charts are designed for manned aircraft pilots to fly using VFR, or Visual Flight Rules, which basically means they're flying at low to medium altitudes with good visibility. The maps are intended to provide five bits of information. Landmarks, such as rivers, lakes, highways, and built-up areas. Aerodromes and some of their basic characteristics. Airways and controlled airspace navigational aids, and hazards such as obstructions, towers, glider areas, and restricted airspace. There are two kinds of VFR charts, VNC and VTA charts. VNC stands for VFR Navigation Charts, and in the US these are called sectional charts. They have a scale of 1 to 500,000 when in paper form. If you do the math, a typical drone operation of, say, 500 meters would be one millimeter on a paper copy of these charts. Just a dot. When looking at these charts online, you can zoom in, but you don't see any further detail when you do so. The other kind of VFR chart is the VTA chart, which stands for VFR Terminal Area Chart, or, as the name suggests, a chart focusing on the major air terminals. In the US, these are called terminal area charts or TACs. VTA charts are at a scale of 1 to 250,000, twice the scale of a VNC chart. So you are able to see more detail in these areas, but still really not very helpful for drone operations. The entire area of Canada is covered by 52 separate VNC charts plus seven of the more detailed VTA charts. There are no explicit expiry dates on these charts, strangely, and they have update cycles anywhere between one and 10 years, depending on the specific map. You can buy paper copies of the maps from Nav Canada or from various other outlets, or access them free online, and I'll show you where. The best online source I have found is flightplan.com. If you go to their site, you have to navigate around a bit. First select Digital Charts, then View Charts, then pick Sectionals-Canada on the drop-down, then you finally navigate to your location. The VNC and VTA chart boundaries are blended seamlessly and make it very easy to move around. By the way, you can access CFS Canada Flight Supplement information also on the flight plan.com site via their FBO and airport information link. Another online resource is Skyvector. I actually find Skyvector much easier to navigate and search, but it does show only American style VFR charts. Basically the same information, but in a slightly different format. And by the way, we link to Skyvector from the Drone Pilot Canada app. And we do this because it provides deep links to specific locations and specific airport information. Well, and you don't have to navigate around menus. Flightplan.com doesn't offer that kind of flexibility. Okay, let's dive into these maps. First, a short refresher on latitude and longitude. Lines of latitude are parallel to the equator and are evenly spaced all the way to the north and south poles. The equator is zero degrees latitude the North Pole is 90 degrees north, and the South Pole is 90 degrees... anyone? That's right, south. Each degree of latitude is divided into 60 minutes, and each minute is further divided into 60 seconds. Now, here's a fun fact. They originally defined the nautical mile as one minute of latitude. And that's actually useful to know, because sometimes it's tough to find the scale marker on these maps, but the minutes of latitude are usually visible, and one tick mark on the VFR chart is one minute, and so one nautical mile. Okay, now, lines of longitude. These guys are different. 
they divide up the globe like wedges of an orange, and they all meet at the poles. Zero degrees longitude runs through Greenwich, England, and is called the prime meridian. Meridians of longitude are numbered east and west from there, meeting in the Pacific at 180 degrees. The international date line roughly follows the 180th meridian of longitude. So every place on Earth can be defined with a latitude and longitude using the DMS coordinates, DMS meaning degrees, minutes, seconds. For example, Thunder Bay, Ontario is at 48 degrees, 22 minutes, 55 seconds north, 89 degrees, 14 minutes, 45 seconds west. With the weird degrees and minutes, DMS coordinates are a massive pain in the butt for everyone, especially for computers. So there's another way of expressing lat long locations called the decimal method. Using the simpler decimal method, Thunder Bay is at 48.38221 and minus 89 0.246109. Much easier to type, say, and especially cut and paste. Note that everywhere in Canada has a positive latitude and a negative longitude. The negative longitude is important to remember. And it was, it's negative because someone decided east is positive and west is negative. Now, if you're one of those fortunate few to own a computer or a phone, it's incredibly easy to determine any location's latitude and longitude, or vice versa. You just tap on Google Maps or search the lat long numbers and boom, boom, instant and precise. Transport Canada, however, expects you to be able to manually use a VFR chart for this same purpose. So here's a few hints. When you look at a VFR map, you'll see a black grid imposed on the map. Predictably, these are the lines of latitude and longitude. And of course, true north is always at the top. On VNC charts, the grid lines are half a degree or 30 minutes apart. In the areas where there are VTA charts around those seven major terminals, the grids are a quarter of a degree or 15 minutes apart. But in either case, the little tick marks along those lines are always one minute of latitude or longitude. Not all of these lines are labeled, but if you look around a little bit, you'll find one that says something like 48 degrees north, and away you go, you can make your way from there. Speaking of major lines on these maps, every once in a while, you'll see a heavy dashed line running up and down on an angle. And if you look along these lines, you'll find a number like 12 degrees west. These are lines of equal magnetic declination called isogonic lines. They tell you the difference between magnetic north and true north. Meridians of longitude point to true north, but magnetic compasses point to the magnetic north pole, which of course is not in the same place as the true north pole. Okay, what else is on a VFR map? Let's start with land features and landmarks. Aside from the obvious roads and railways, lakes and rivers, there are a couple of symbols that might not be obvious. First is this pointy thing that shows the location of transmission towers or other tall things like smokestacks. They show either single towers or groups of towers, depending on what's there. And there are different symbols for high ones and really high ones. The height of these obstacles is shown as feet above sea level, but the elevation above ground level is also shown in brackets underneath. The other ground feature that might not be completely obvious is this squiggly line, which shows major power lines, you know, the, the, one, the really high ones with towers. Sometimes they're portrayed with a broken line with small tower symbols periodically shown. Oh, and the yellow areas signify built-up areas like villages, towns, and cities. Local peaks of elevation are shown with a black dot with the elevation, in this case 403 feet, 
nearby. And of course, that's above sea level. When you're looking at a VNC map, as opposed to a VTA chart, the maximum elevation, so the highest point in one of those lat long grid squares, is shown with a big and little number, meaning thousands and hundreds of feet. So in this case, 10,600 feet. Now we get to the airports and airspace markings. There are three levels of airports shown on VFR charts. Big ones, or technically ones that have particularly long runways, shown as a set of runways. Medium-sized airports, shown as a circle with a runway or two, just depending on the airport, displayed inside the circle, and sometimes with pegs around the outside, indicating facilities like fuel. And smaller airfields, shown simply as open circles. There are also abandoned airports with an X through them, unverified airports with a U inside, and a seaplane base with an anchor. An H, predictably, is for a heliport, and if that H is in a cross shape as opposed to a circle, it's a hospital heliport. Note that the size of an airport is not necessarily an indication that it is certified versus registered, so you'll still need to look that up for drone keepout zones. Sometimes you'll see small symbols to alert you to special aviation activities in the area. This little airplane symbol indicates that you may encounter aircraft training in the area. That one's kind of obscure, but there's more obvious symbols as well for soaring, ultralights, hang gliders, and parachuting. Now, nearby every aerodrome, you'll find a small block of text with information about that aerodrome. First is the standard name for the aerodrome, like St. Hyacinth, for example. But they don't show you the airport code, the four-letter code, which personally I find a little annoying. Now, if there's an M in brackets after the airport name, it's a military airport. Underneath every one of these airports, underneath the name, from left to right, are the elevation above sea level, in feet of course, in this case 118 feet. Next, an indication of runway lighting. A simple L means there are lights. <laughs> Pretty obvious. Well, an L with a box around it like this indicates pilot controlled lighting, which is kind of cool. It's activated by clicking your mic on the airport frequency a particular number of times. By the way, on American charts, they show an asterisk beside the L instead of a box around it. And if there's no lighting at the airport, there is simply no L of any kind. Next in line is the approximate length of the longest runway in hundreds of feet. So 38 means roughly 3,800 feet in this case. Finally, the airport radio frequency, here 123.2. An M in front of the frequency indicates that it is a mandatory frequency. Okay, next are airspace boundaries. If you look at the major airports, you will see prominent markings around them. For drone pilots, you're normally interested in airspace that, that starts at the ground, at the surface, which would be the first line you encounter moving out from the center of an airport. Both class C and class D airspace are marked with a square bracket symbol like this. Around the edge will be an indication of whether it is class C or class D. Class E airspace is marked with a heavy dashed line and will be marked simply CZ for control zone with the altitude. Higher level control zones are also marked, but they start well above 400 feet. So unless you have special permission to fly very high, or you're having a vertical flyaway, these are not particularly relevant for drone pilots. Class F restricted and advisory zones are marked with this prominent fence-like line and the CYR or CYA zone numbers inside. The CYR restricted zones are no-fly zones for drones of any size, including sub-250 drones, unless you have permission. CYA zones are advisory zones and will be marked with a, the kind of activity that's taking place in the area, such as parachuting or glider traffic. For more information 
about airspace and aerodromes and how they affect drone operations, I strongly recommend you watch my cleverly named video, Airspace and Aerodromes for Drone Pilots. In some areas, VFR routes, like highways for aircraft really, are marked with paths of triangles or diamonds. And reporting points can be marked with pennants like this. In either of these cases, you can expect aircraft to appear regularly, which is good to know if you have a drone operation in that area. Well, there we have it. What a drone pilot needs to know about VFR charts. And honestly, it makes no sense that Transport Canada requires us to be able to read these charts. The scale is such that our operations are not much more than a dot on the map, and only a few of the real ground hazards are visible. Google or any other online map provides much more detail. And the aerodrome and airspace information on VFR charts is frankly difficult to discern and insufficient for drone operations. You can't tell the class of the airport. The drone keepout zones, of course, are not shown and the airport contact information isn't available. Much simpler, more clear and appropriate information is available on the NRC drone site selection tool or in the Drone Pilot Canada app. So in my opinion, while it is a TC knowledge requirement, it's about as useful as tits on a bull, as my father-in-law was fond of saying. If you found this video helpful, please give me a thumbs up and drop a comment down below. And please subscribe to my channel, ring that bell for notifications of future videos. Thanks for watching.